welcome, welcome to the third annual Women Build Initiative panel discussion and kickoff. Um, we are so glad you're here. I'm Carmen Holmes, VP of Development for Dallas Area Habitat for Humanity. And did you know that over 800 people registered for this event today? So um, you are part of an immense and really wonderful audience. This is the third time we've had this conversation and we learn something new every year. We're so grateful um, that you're here. We're so grateful that our panelists here um, and we're going to be recording this event. And so we will send you a link following the event to um, give you all of the good information that we talked about, but also some of the slides that we're going to share with you about women build and how to get involved. Um, in a minute, we're going to meet our hosts and our terrific panelists. Um, but first, I have the privilege and honor of sharing a little bit with you about women build. Um, before we get started with our discussion. So first and foremost, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors that have already signed on to be a part of the Women Build Initiative, Hilti North America, Mr. Cooper Group, Toyota Financial, a new sponsor this year. Thank you so much. Schneider Electric, another new sponsor. Terrific to have you. Um, Next Bank, a returning uh, OG, and uh, Mackie Wolf, Zeintz and Mann, a law firm. Uh, we're grateful to have you. We're excited to see you on the build site and we know it's gonna be a great women build year. So we'd love to give a shout out to your company. Here's a shameless plug for how to get involved with women build as a sponsor. Um, we'd love to give a shout out to your company. My email is gonna be in the chat. If you're interested in sponsorship or just getting involved, please feel free to reach out to me and uh, we'll make sure that we get you connected to women build. So Women Build is a, it's an important discussion. And uh, I personally am really grateful for a CEO and a Habitat leadership team um, that feels like this is an important conversation and that our internal and our external conversations really should support diversity, um, in equity and inclusion. And they should really talk about how we feel about people and how people are treated. Um, so that's one of the reasons why Women Build came to be. There's actually several reasons. Um, and I'll share those with you. But we engaged in this reboot about three years ago. Um, we had had other women builds, but really women build initiative became a larger conversation for several reasons. Um, we wanted to bring the discussion to Dallas um, about how women as single wage earners face really unique challenges um, as they're saving for home ownership on their own. And they're working to build a more stable, brighter financial future for their families, but they're doing this all on their own. And there are some really poignant statistics around the clients that we serve at Dallas Habitat. So 69% of our clients are women single head of household, 41% of those women are single moms, and over 90% of those women are women of color. And that conversation never gets old. We need to continue to have that conversation until we find a way to bridge a gap for these families that we're serving. Um, and that's why we're here today. That's part of why we're here today. So we can talk about how do we bridge the gap for others. Um, second, with the Women Build Initiative, we wanted to engage really smart, talented, generous, wonderful, capable women in the discussion about how we can all take intentional steps to serve one another and empower one another as we accomplish our dreams. So we can all be change makers. Um, that's the topic of today's discussion. We can all be change makers and we can all use our personal talents and skills to lift up other women uh, in our own personal circles. And then finally, we wanted to engage in uh, women and community partners in service in the community, um, building on the build site, uh, volunteering with Habitat, raising funds, starting teams, walking side by side um, on this journey to create a wave and a tide that rises us all. Um, so Women Build does raise funds and we raise awareness for three important programs. Um, we have accomplished some amazing things in the past couple of years. Um, I know there's an impact slide on the, on the screen, but we can talk about the number of women that we've educated with a financial education, financial literacy. Uh, we can talk about the number of homes that we've built, the number of volunteer hours, the number of hands that have been on this project. Um, and they're pretty, pretty impressive statistics. And we're going to do that very same thing again this year. Um, as I mentioned, 800 of you registered for this event. We're thrilled to have you all here. That's a pretty impressive number. Um, so financial literacy and homeownership for women, single head of household is one of the pillars of Women Build. 
And at Dallas Habitat, we actually commit over half a million dollars every year to financial and home buyer education and to providing that service and that home buyer program um, for families that desire uh, to seek that dream of home ownership. We also raise funds for neighborhood empowerment and we work to achieve neighborhood empowerment and improvement. And at Dallas Habitat, we invest thousands of volunteer hours into community service and advocacy. Uh, and last but certainly not least, Women Build provides funding for a newly constructed affordable home for a low income hardworking family. This is a true and beautiful and virtuous partnership between Dallas Habitat and the families that purchase our homes. It's a lifelong journey. Um, many times 25, 30 years um, when a family pays off their home, we celebrate with them at the end of that journey. Um, but this is a this is a partnership for a, a long time, not just a sprint. Um, so I uh, love the concept of Women Build. It's, it's one of my favorite things to work on here at Habitat. And most of the messages that I receive from you say, hey, I love Women Build too. How can I get involved? And so I want to share a little bit about that with you today. I've already talked about sponsorships just a bit. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about some of these ways to engage. All of this info is also available on our website and will be sent out as part of your link uh, that you receive after today's discussion. So first and foremost, uh, or not first and foremost, but one of the ways, um, you can get your company involved as a Women Build sponsor. Uh, many companies have employee resource groups that are focused on women, uh, women's conversations. Any of your employee resource groups can get involved. But if that's you know, a group that wants to come out and support and be a part of Women Build, we would encourage that. Again, just shoot me an email and we'll get you connected to the project. Um, you can start a Women Build team. So um, I, as an individual, send out a, my personal link and I can register on our website. We'll, we'll send you that information as well. But I can send that link out to my girlfriends, my friends, my family, my, my peer, colleague, friends, network, um, and I can invite other people to join my team. I can tell them about Women Build and then I can invite them to raise funds, raise awareness, participate in the events with me, alongside me. And our website allows you to do all of that. Um, you can also participate as an individual. You can just say, hey, this initiative is important to me and invite your friends and colleagues in that same circle of, of folks around you um, to support you in Women Build. And if you would like to come out and build with us, uh, we want to we wanna hear from you. We want to know how to get you involved. So there's a place for everyone. Um, you can also make an individual donation. We have a, a new platform this year. We've got our website. You can still go on our website at dallasareahabitat.org and make a donation. Um, but we have a new, wonderful, and easy, convenient way to make a donation to Women Build today. And that's our text to give program. So if you uh, want a text to give, that number that you'll see on your screen is um, just text Women Build to 24365, and you can make your donation there before we get started. Um, finally, you can also join our hospitality team. We have a really wonderful group of ladies. Um, and if you're a gentleman, you can also join the hospitality team. We are, we are uh, inclusive of all. Um, if you wanna join the hospitality team, we have a wonderful group of women that come out and they basically host the build day. So they get you all checked in on the build site. Um, they are helpful in getting a lot of things organized and just a little more comfortable on the build site. So if you'd like to site host and be a part of that hospitality team, we'd love to have you. Um, so that's really, actually, no, I have one more announcement. We just, um, we have some new information about our um, women build homeowner. So we are excited to announce that that uh, family has just been identified um, in the last uh, day or so. Um, Bernice Perry is a single mom and she is a middle school special education teacher and she attends Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship Church and has two boys that are gonna be living with her. Malin is 12 and he's in the sixth grade and he loves playing video games, sports and hanging out with friends. And then Ladarian is 21 and he's in college completing his physical therapy assistant degree while working at Frito-Lay. So Ladarian enjoys working out and coaching kids. And we are so excited to learn more about this family. This is just kind of the teaser. This is all the information I get. And so I'm excited to meet Bernice. Um, I'm excited to share in this journey with her and learn uh, all the things that she accomplished to get to this place. And I'm looking forward to celebrating with her as she moves into her new uh, wonderful Habitat home and she prepares for a better financial future for her, herself and for her boys. 
So thank you so much again for being here. We're so grateful for you. Um, this is going to be an amazing discussion. Um, it's going to be difficult to top last year, but I know we're going to do it. So now please let me introduce um, our MC for the day, Lady Jade. Lady Jade is amazing. She is, um, she is back again this year. We cannot imagine this Women Build Panel discussion without her. She is a syndicated radio personality. Many of you know her, listen to her, follow her on Instagram. Um, she's terrific. So I'm excited to turn it over to Jade, who's going to introduce you to our panelists and get our discussion started. Thank you so much for being here. We're so grateful you're a part of the Women Build discussion. Thanks, Carmen. And let me tell you, I can tell we have a really great group today because I'm loving all the love for Vernice in the chat. Everybody saying congratulations. And this is what today is all about. Everybody coming together, having a really great time, learning from each other, cheering each other along. So Carmen, thank you guys for always having me. I really appreciate it. Love it. Thanks, Jade. As I said, you guys, thanks for being here today. Today is such an exciting day, you guys. I am so excited about Women Build this year. Um, we have an incredible panel of stellar women here today to teach us how we can all create change in our communities. Um, if, if I'm counting correctly, I believe this is my third year being a part of Women Build. And I have to say, this definitely is one of my favorite chats to have. Um, if you don't know, you know, Women Build is as a community of strong, dedicated women coming together to be a force of good in ourselves and in our communities. And what I love about each woman joining us today is how they truly, truly have a heart for women and they truly have a heart for our community. You guys, each of them advocate for women and believe in women having confidence and knowing their worth. So I'm going to get right to it because I can't wait for you to meet the ladies that are going to be on our panel today. Um, I'm going to introduce them first, and then I'll have them briefly come back on and tell us a little bit more about themselves. So first, we have Miss Allison Brayman, who is the Senior Vice President of Human Resources for Hilti North America. Allison, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much. Uh, first, before jumping in, I feel compelled to give a, a nod to my amazing leader, Martina McIsaac, who was to have been here today. Uh, her passion, her commitment day in, day out, um, both professionally and in the community is, is phenomenal. She considers herself really to be privileged to be this year's chair of the Women's Dallas Build, um, but I'm humbled to also be here in her place. So thanks for having me. Um, I am the vice president for human resources for Hilti North America. We're 30,000 people worldwide, 4,000 here in North America. Um, my partner and I have an amazing five-year-old daughter, and we've been in the Dallas community now for about 10 years, which uh, is the longest I've lived anywhere in my life. Uh, growing <laughs> up as a bit of a nomad. So I feel connected to the community and excited to be here. Thanks. I love it. And we love Martina too. Martina was here last year. She is an amazing person and, but thank you so much for stepping in and see that's community, right? When you can call somebody and say, Hey, can you cover me? So uh, we definitely appreciate that. I really want to say real quick, Allison, there's something really cool about you that I want everybody to know. Um, I was reading an article and I love how you said, um, you always have your ear to the ground so you can understand what's meaningful and what matters to your team members. And I love that because that that is community, right? Um, thank you for having that approach when it comes to your team. I, I just think, I was like, oh my gosh, that is so cool. Thanks, thanks for saying that. I think this last couple of years in particular has been eye-opening for all of us that you can never really underestimate what other people are going through and the things sure. that are on each other's plates. And uh, so thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for being here today. Next up, we have Ms. Kellyanne Doherty, who is the Chief Administrative Officer for Mr. Cooper Group. And she was also our 2021 Women Build Chair. Kelly Ann, welcome back. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you to Habitat for giving me another opportunity to talk to this group. The 2021 Build was a truly remarkable experience for me. And I can't wait to share a little bit about what I've learned. I'm Kelly Ann Doherty, I'm the CAO for the Mr. Cooper Group and responsible for a variety of things, including human resources, brand, communications. Um, but I think what's my most important role is just being an advocate for our culture, because I really believe that when you're leading an organization, and you're impacting the culture of your team members, you're also impacting the culture of your community. And it's been a really rewarding job. 
I um, was not born in Texas, but I got here as fast as I could. We moved to the area when I was 12, and I live in Colleyville today with uh, two pandemic puppies plus my husband. Um, so yeah, don't recommend getting pandemic dogs, um, <laughs> but I did it anyway. And uh, they're super fun, but really loud, and they're currently locked out of this room. So oh my god, um, if you hear any barking in the background, that's Look, that's them. Not just one, but two pandemic puppies. Omg. They had to have a friend. It was, it was a whole, it was a whole. Now, I got to tell you guys, um, Kellyanne was here last year with us. And this is when I knew Kellyanne was my girl. So I guess, well, first of all, congratulations, because since last year, this is a new position for you. Um, you know, yeah. that's amazing. I love that. But what I learned about Kellyanne uh, last time we were on in 2021 is she had received another promotion a few years earlier. She chose Beyonce's Who Want Who Run the World Girl song to walk into. <laughs> and I said, You are a woman after my own heart. Yes. Shouts out to the beehive. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Although now after Sunday night, I might be changing that song to a Mary J. Blige song because oh <laughs> that I'm still dying over it. I literally looked up where I could buy those boots. Um, <laughs> she does so have the best boots. I'm, I'm sure everybody else is feeling that too. She's definitely brought the energy and I've watched it probably 15 times. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Oh yeah. my gosh. See so what good. I'm saying? Thank you so much for being here. Thank I am you. so glad you're back. Thank you. Um, up next, we have Ms. Marty McDonald, who is the founder and the CEO of Boss Women Media. Marty, thank you so much for being here this year. Thank you so much, Jade. I'm so excited to be connected with you in this capacity. Normally, um, our capacity of connection is so different. So thank you for um, um, having me be a part. I'm excited to be a part of today's chat. Yeah. So, so Marty, I want you to tell them a little bit about you because you were a corporate queen. You decided to take this leap, right? Um, because you had a passion for building women in small businesses. So talk a little bit more about that. Tell us a little bit more about you. Yeah. Um, I, as Jay mentioned, how we identify at Boston and Media, I was a corporate queen for 11 years. Um, and I decided to take a big, big leap about four years ago to start my organization that I run called Boss Women Media. Boss Women Media um, is a storytelling company. We storytell the pathways of how women are creating businesses or careers that others who look like them can learn from um, and see their own possibility through that. So I'm excited as I am a huge advocate for women, the rights of women, um, how women lean in, how women have seats at the table, how they ask for what they deserve. So excited to, to be a part of this conversation and share a little bit more about who I am and what we do. And Kellyanne is a, is a puppy pandemic mom and you are a pandemic mommy. Like you had just had a baby. A so <laughs> and these pandemic babies, they different, okay? <laughs> So I can only imagine how the pandemic dogs are different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thanks for being here, Marty. I appreciate it. And then next up, we have Miss Rebecca Acuna, who is the Director of Government Affairs for PepsiCo. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. And like, shout out to Rebecca. She was at another event. She literally had to run into another room to make sure that she was going to be in attendance with us today. So that is pure dedication. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you so much for that invitation. I've been with PepsiCo about five years. I started representing uh, Texas first and then quickly got a seven state region. And prior to joining PepsiCo, my heart was in campaigns and government. I am so passionate about making sure women are represented in political and appointed roles because I see that as such a huge way to make an impact on millions of people. And you're being a little modest too, because you were featured in the 2021 edition of DCEO's Dallas 500 list. Um, you also were selected for Dallas Business Journal's, uh, what was it, 40 leaders under the age of 40? That's correct. We Look, we Thank pop you. our collar here at <laughs> Women Build, okay? We, we brag on ourselves here. And I have to ask you this. Uh, is it true that you keep an emergency bag of spicy chips under the seat of your car? <laughs> yes. Here's what happens, right? I go to the grocery store and I get a big bag of spicy chips and then I start 
I open them up when I'm still in my car before I get home. And I've gone through so many of them and then I'm embarrassed to take it out for everyone to know. And so I crush it up and hide it under my seat until I'm driving by myself. And I'm like, oh, I've got some yummy snacks right oh here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Rebecca, that is funny and kind of gross at the same time, but I understand. <laughs> Spicy chips are, are the move, I understand. Well, ladies, thank you all for joining us. Uh, throughout our discussion today, we want to find out how did you do it? And how can everyone else that's attending today become a change agent and a force for good here in Dallas? Um, I want to get started by acknowledging the fact that these past two years have been tough, right? Um, definitely taking a toll on women in Dallas, as well as around the country. Uh, multiple studies tell us that women are maxed out. If you think about it, um, we're trying to balance work, child care for those with children, family, finances, pets, and the list goes on and on. So I'm going to start with you, Rebecca. How do women like you find the time and the energy to take on just one more thing, right? Like life changing and making change in the community. So I'm going to give you some practical advice and then some more emotional advice. The, the practical advice is like, I was always a mess schedule wise. So the, the best advice I got on organizing was like literally to put everything on my calendar. This means my walk. This means yoga. This means when am I going to see my mom and, and plan it all out, plan your you time and treat that as like the most important appointment. The change making side was, I always had a lot of, and still have a lot of self-doubt. And one time when I was going to start a new job, this is when I was going to start working in Congress. I, I felt like, oh, I was going to be so behind. Everyone was going to know so much more than me. And there was a very, very senior political reporter who casually told me, wow, you're going to start this new role with so much more experience than most of the people here. And that gave me confidence. And that, like, it just took away my self-doubt from that role just by someone else casually dropping a comment telling me I was ready. And that really just made me want to give back to other people too. I, I love that. You brought up self-doubt because I was going to ask, Am I the only one that deals with the self-doubt and like the inability to balance my schedule sometimes? So that was a really great point. Anybody else want to chime in? Go ahead, Marty. <laughs> Go ahead, Marty. <laughs> uh, you know, self-doubt is real. Like you all, you will always doubt yourself when you are trying something new, right? But the on the other side of doubt is opportunity. On the other side of doubt is um, confidence. Once you receive the confidence on the other side of self-doubt, you remove self-doubt, right? How do you remove self-doubt? You try. The best advice that I can give to another woman is putting themselves out there in a place to try and experiment new things so that they can know that they are worthy, that they can do it. But it starts at a very young age. And, and I think that you can incorporate it at any age. So for me specifically, as I'm raising this one-year-old daughter, I'm going to have her explore all of her possibilities. I'm going to have her try everything because I want her to be in a place, in a position where she doesn't think it's not for her because she doesn't see herself in it. If I'm this 36 year old woman and I am wanting to explore and try new things um, and I'm trying to remove the self-doubt from that, I have to put myself in position. I think the an, another really key point to that is putting yourself in position to be around people who believe in you, who can give you that little nod. Rebecca got that nod. She got that nod and then it gave her the confidence. You don't have to have a big crew. It don't have to be 10, 20 people. You can have a crew of two, three, just somebody who just pushes you along your way and says you can. That's how you change self-doubt. So I just, I love everything that you just said, Marty, because that's kind of my, my personal mantra throughout my life. And that's to swim outside your lane and just like jump into the deep end. And I say that because so often when you're given an opportunity to, to do something new, it's scary. And I don't know that imposter syndrome ever really goes away. I experience it almost every single day. What I've learned over time is to embrace it and use it as a motivating factor to continue to learn, grow, and get better. But what I'll say to everybody out there is, 
just try it. The first time you jump in and it's a little bit scary and you feel like you don't belong, you learn something from that experience. But here's the best thing about that is you get a little bit braver every time you're going to jump in. Once you do it once, you know you can do it a second time and a third time and a fourth time. And that type of momentum builds on itself. So I really encourage people to just jump in, jump in and try things that you've never done before. If you've been given an opportunity, especially within your career to try something different or grow in a different way, it's because somebody believes in you. Um, Remember that it's coming from a place of belief in you. And so the best thing that you can do is believe in yourself, give yourself a chance and then continue to learn along the way. But this idea that it goes away, I don't think is true. I, I, I don't know about everybody else. I just feel it. I feel it almost every day. And I think that that's okay. As long as you, you don't let it get in the way of mm-hmm. trying something new and facing your fears. That's good. I Allison. agree with that too. I mean, I was thinking about all the comments made already and that, you know, as women, I think there's a tendency that we all feel every box needs to be checked. We need to make sure that we're able to do things in such a perfected way before we, you know, have maybe the courage or the willingness to kind of put ourselves out there. And I, I also battle with that and try to, you know, push myself to, to not get stuck in that mode. Um, and, and I guess other thoughts that just run through my mind are just, you know, realizing that none of us have to go through things alone. Um, You know, there's so many needs. We all have our own personal ebbs and flows that we're navigating. And for me, I think my overwhelm sometimes can get, can get reduced when I just remember that, you know, I don't have to try to take everything on myself and it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help or to show your vulnerability that maybe you're in a space that's a little bit outside your comfort zone. And, normally when that's happened, you know, you realize that you actually have, maybe it is one or two people around you, or maybe it is 20, but you've got someone there beside you that's kind of able to help boost you um, in the direction that maybe you need to go and give you that encouragement to try and to put yourself out there and, and um, be willing to, you know, maybe crash a little bit and that's okay. Um, So everyone's comments, yeah, for sure resonate with me as well. Oh, I, I love this. And you know, I, I love the transparency. I think that sometimes we see people from an outer scope and people appear to be, you know, you guys are very much accomplished. So it seems like they can't deal with the same things that I deal with on a daily basis. And what we find out about one another is we're all human, no matter what stage of life we are in. Right. And I think there's a comfort in that. And I think that I know in this moment, and I'm sure a lot of women that are tuned in today have just literally exhaled just to know that they're not alone in these feelings, you know, and Kellyanne, I love how you said it doesn't go away. Like every day, there's a, there's a point where you're like, "Uh Oh, you know what I mean? Allison, you're, you spoke on trying to, you know, we want to be superwoman all the time. I think that we can't ask for help and we have to do it alone. So I, I just think that's, some, that's amazing. This is why I love this panel because this panel is you are girls, girls, you're all about girl power and up, uplifting women. So I want to ask you all, um, anybody feel free to jump in. What is the most important piece of advice that you can give to a young person who is currently trying to make change in the world? Uh, So I'll jump in. It starts with what I said, and that's to give you bet on yourself and try new things. But the other thing I would say to that is that, you know, it starts with one. Um, changing the world starts with one person. And so when you start to think about the impact that you want to make, um, think about the person next to you or the person in front of you and try to impact their lives in a positive way. As I think as women, especially women that are high achievers, we want to do all the things all at once. And I've seen what the power of one can do. And I think that what we're doing here with the Women's Build is a great example of that. Think about how becoming a homeowner is not going to just change the lives of the woman who gets that home, but the lives of her children and their grandchildren, because she's building generational wealth. It's changing the community that we build the home in. And so, you know, when I think about how to become a change change agent, I, I always start with one. And that really comes from an experience that I had in college. I had a professor who really looked out for me and gave me some great opportunities. And he told me that I'm going to do this for you, but you've got to promise that you're going to do it for somebody else. Promise me that you'll pay it forward. And I've taken that to heart um, every day since. So whether it's in your career or in your community, start with one. And I think that when you see that momentum kind of start to carry itself through and you start to see the impact of one, it makes it that much easier to think even broader and bigger. 
Mm. Eliane, I love that. I, I, I live by the motto, lift as you rise, right? Um, if you are, if you are going up, make sure that you bring somebody along with you. I think that that's how we change the world. That's how we change the trajectory of the stories that are being told about women. That's how generations to come don't get to experience the hardships that we have experienced and their pathway is a little bit easier. Um, and even to add to that, I would say you are equipped and you have everything that you need for today's moment for today's obstacle, for today's challenge, so that you in, that you can get through it. For t- don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow has its own problems of its own. Like you have a whole bunch of stuff going on tomorrow. You got to worry about where you are today. And so I believe, especially as being an entrepreneur, the pathway isn't black and white. And so I know that I have been equipped with the people, the resources, the time that I need for today to navigate this entrepreneurial world for today. And so anybody else out there trying to make change in the world, know that you have exactly what it takes for today. You have the right people, you have the right resources, you have the right time, you have the right money, because that's also a big consideration. You just have to look inside. You have to look at what what your resources are, what your money is. And normally that's with the people that are around you. Your network um, is your net worth often. And so you have everything that you need for today if you just focus on the good that you have within you for this moment. That's good. Let me ask, let me ask, Anybody can answer this as well. How are how are you working to inspire the next generation of female advocates? Um, may, maybe it's in a small way. Maybe it's in a big way. So number one, I'll build on what Marty said that incorporates into this. I'm very particular about who I surround myself with, right? And so for young girls, for young women, if you're trying to be a change maker and make a difference, then you should hang around with other young girls and young women who are doing the same thing, because then you're creating what is your new normal. This is not something that's extraordinary. It's just something that is natural to, to help other people. Right. And, and it's, it's normal because everyone around you is supporting you and helping each other out. Now, um, I loved also that as you rise, you lift. So think about someone and Kellyanne mentioned a professor, someone doing something nice for her. All right, are you going to a, a uh, gala, a charity event? Do you have a table? Who can you bring? Can you bring someone who's not yet connected? Who are you going to be introducing to other people? Um, so always be thinking about how you can help other people, whether that's a referral or a connection. That's really good. I was thinking just around the, there's plenty of, you know, systemic boundaries that exist for sure. And so, you know, going back to Kellyanne's comments earlier too, just on, you know, as much as we could inwardly focus on removing our own self instituted boundaries, I think is one element as a, as a starting point. Um, But for me, I also just really think about kind of access and and representation that if if really aiming to be a change maker, you know, sometimes looking in your immediate circle isn't necessarily reflective of obviously the realities of, you know, someone that's maybe, you know, two doors down. So, you know, giving yourself an opportunity to engage with people that are maybe not in your more immediate circle or your more obvious community uh, and, and learning and asking questions around other people's perspectives, I think, you know, gives and opens, opens the door to really think about, you know, what maybe change is actually needed or, you know, where your strengths could be, you know, put to play um, just by, listening to someone else and gaining perspective of, of challenges that might exist outside your own sphere. Um, so that I think is also a really important way to encourage young change makers. I love this. I want to remind everybody, we are going to take questions at the end. You guys, the chat is blowing up. Okay. <laughs> everybody is like, I want to I even this. add something to that, Jay. I love what Allison said about, you know, if you're in your circle, everybody looks like your circle, essentially, then you got to make your circle look uniquely different. Look like what the world looks like, right? 
Um, I think it's so important that we all are allies to one another, right? Whether you're black or white or whatever, I think that making sure that your circle reflects the diversity of the world is how you become a change maker, right? Like that is so important that we don't miss the moment that's happening and that has happened within the last two years of social justice for change makership to become into play. Um, for me specifically, as I said earlier, I have a, a, a new daughter and we're launching a new brand tomorrow called El Olivia, which is all around showcasing big possibilities to little girls and allies. So it's around clothes and merchandise and books um, that showcases what she looks like. But in return, you know, it is Allison and Kellyanne and Rebecca's opportunity to connect through representation of being an ally to those conversations so that their circle is a part of it too. Change can't happen insular. It, it happens when everybody is at the table, when everybody has a unique perspective that we can create culture around. And I think that's really what's so important and key to the moment that we're living in right now for the next generation. Which is a perfect segue um, for, for my next question. Actually, I want to direct this one at Kellyanne. Um, Kellyanne, what do you feel most inspired by when you look at opportunities that young girls will have that maybe you didn't at their age? Oh, wow. That is such a great question. And I feel like a, a lot of what's been already talked about is at the heart of that. And, and, and that we're even having this discussion. Mm -hmm. This panel didn't happen 20 years ago. Um, and I think that there's more women today now in positions of leadership that can help other girls to aspire to be that. But, but more importantly, to Allison's point, can start to break down some of those systemic barriers that exist. And I agree with Marty that the past two years have awakened a lot of people, not just to the gender challenges that we have in this country, but the racial ones. And that's something that I take really personally as a leader. It's up to me. Um, it's not up to everybody else. It's up to me as a leader to, to start to knock down some of those barriers for women. And because I'm in this position and there's other women on this panel in that position, it really makes me feel encouraged. Um, you know, I, I must admit, I grew up in a home in which my dad told me I could be anything I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And I really believed that. And that's what I want for every young girl. I want every girl to think that she can be whatever she wants to be, whether that's president of the United States, whether that's being a mom that I'm not going to say stays at home because we know that moms at home have the hardest job out there. But, <laughs> but you know, I think that the possibilities are endless. And so that's what I, I love most about today is the conversation. It's the awareness that we need to be opening up those doors. Um, and there's a lot of women like the ones that are here and in this chat who I really believe are going to continue to carry on that conversation. And that's what's so exciting to me. And we have, by the way, that our first vice president, that's a woman. How, I mean, how great is that? When she got sworn in, I, I got emotional. I, I didn't think I was going to get emotional, but just watching her be that, be that woman, it was a really powerful moment. Um, you know, one that I didn't know I would get to see in my lifetime and to see her um, be the vice president of this country just really, really excited me for all the girls that were watching at the same time. And Rebecca, I can see you barely being able to hold back your smile. You were very instrumental in um, that election process. Am I right? Yes, I was the uh, state director for the Biden-Harris campaign in Texas, and I had the pleasure of introducing now Vice President Harris at her stop in Fort Worth. And I, I couldn't sleep the night before. I was so nervous because, you know, they are like, you have three minutes. And in three minutes, you've got to introduce yourself talk about the future vice president, connect to the audience that's physically there, connect to the audience that's watching. And, um, you know, I, I was up all night just full of anxiety trying to get everything right. But the, but the coolest part was offstage. Um, this is pre-vaccine, so we were not getting close to each other. But, but I walked off right after my introduction of her and, and she comes up to me and she says, I am so proud of you. I know that you have, there have been so many times when you have been in a room where you are the only one who looks like you. And it is so important for you to continue to be in those spaces so that we can have more change. I'm so proud of you. Thank you for being in those spaces where you're the only one 
who looks like you. And then she got on stage and started crying. <laughs> so that, and we're all and about to cry right been, now. Hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. I am like, oh my gosh, like she said that to you. This is so cool. <laughs> I have to tell you, Rebecca, as you're talking, I have this picture of my daughter. She's five. I mentioned in the opening and um, during the during the inauguration, we have a picture of her standing in front of our TV, looking up at at, um, you know, Vice President Harris. And it's just amazing. And she had her her chucks on and we dug out. My mom had given me some pearls before she passed away. And so we had put my mom's pearls on. And so she had her chucks and her pearls and she was just inspired by by her so congratulations for your involvement that's amazing oh my gosh talk about a moment in time just freezing that moment in time that is that thank you for sharing that story I appreciate that Woo! is everybody everybody in the chat is fighting back tears they're all saying omg omg that was great what, what a great story um Kellyanne let me ask you about programs here right are, are there programs in our in our region that we can I guess really continue building for our young girls and young women um and is there a specific area in Dallas that we should be paying more attention to? Well, I'm going to start with this build um, right here. I'm going to start with Women's Build for Habitat for Humanity. I am really passionate about Habitat's mission, more broadly speaking. But when you think about the impact that it's having on women and our communities, you're really talking about our communities. We all know that women are the heart of the home and the heart of our communities. And to be able to not only provide financial education um, that helps them get on a path to home ownership, but provide actual home ownership to women really is setting the stage for, as I said earlier, um, the community that we're, we're living in and really being able to build that out. And for me, that's um, a huge part of why I, I am a part and will continue to be a part of the Women's Build because it really is um, creating a future for not just the young girls that are in our community today, but young girls to come. And so that's something I'm really proud of and so excited for the new homeowner as she embarks on that, to be a middle school teacher, a special ed teacher at that, and, and be able to um, finally say that she's a homeowner is a really special thing. So I really encourage everybody here to get super involved in this because A, you're surrounded by women who really believe in this mission, but you are fundamentally changing the fabric of our community at the same time. And I think that that's amazing. Um, but you know, for other young women that are interested in getting involved and, and giving back, there's so many different opportunities out there, whether that's through the United Way and their Young Professionals Group, the Dallas Regional Chamber has some amazing um, networking opportunities that connect women who want to be of impact. And I think that both of those are good places to look, but I'm biased. So I would say start, start here, start I, here. And I find would say a way the to same thing. <laughs> I think we're all a little biased. No, I love that. I, I, I absolutely love that. Allison, let me ask you this, because earlier you mentioned um, the pandemic, you know, we've all had to shift. If you think about it, there has been a major shift um, and it's kind of caused a backslide in progress for women. If, I don't know if you would agree with that, but how can we combat this, right? So that we can continue to progressively move forward as women. Yeah, it's a great question. And the topic, it's, it's overwhelming, really, when you look at the stats of women that are exiting the workforce or having to, you know, take, you know, reduction in hours or maybe, you know, move into totally different roles as a result of the scenario that they've found themselves in. And um, so it's a, it's a topic that we actively talk through in our organization. Um, you know, one, one solution, I guess, or one area of focus, I think the importance of sponsorship and mentorship is for sure, uh, one key element that, you know, whether you're part of a big organization, small one, all of us can take action in that arena, um, you know, getting to know somebody on a more one to one level, helping to give them an open door, helping them to assess the things that maybe make them tick, um, giving them, you know, support. Um, you know, connecting people to your network. I mean, all of those things play a really, really important. Um, and maybe and maybe the most important um, role um, to really, you know, help help make sure to, to open doors and support others in a in a one to one way. Um, you know, in our organization, we've also done some things really specifically around trust based working hours. I mean, I think one of the reasons we've maybe in our company bucked a little bit of this trend, um, our retention actually is 
slightly stronger than uh, on, on our women's retention, it's slightly stronger than our men's. And I'm proud of that, but I think some of it comes from the fact that we've tried to just adapt as we go and realize that people maybe just need more flexibility and to be a little bit more understanding that aside from policies and all of those things, you know, how do we just have good trusting relationships between leaders and team members? And so that might be an area, you know, in your, in your business environment where you could, you know, assess how you're able to, you know, help create a little bit more ease for especially women that are juggling all sorts of complications at home and, and, you know, taking the brunt of all the responsibilities. Um, we've implemented different policies and things like different leaves of absences, um, backup dependent care, you know, anything we can do to try to help cover our women, especially maybe in one small way. And then cumulatively, I think those things sort of help and add up, but, um, but it's a real challenge and a real problem and flexibility understanding is challenging, especially if maybe the leader isn't experiencing that same challenge. And so, you know, if, if you maybe have a male leader who might not have some of those same challenges as an example, it might be a little bit more difficult to get them to understand. So I think the more we can talk about these topics in an aggregate way um, in our communities or in our business worlds to help others, again, see the perspective of what other people might be having to juggle or go through, I think it helps us come up with good solutions and um, you know, creative ways to start working together across companies even and, and coming up with ways that we can maybe work together with our talent pools and um, it's, it's definitely a need that won't be solved simply. You mentioned earlier too, um, about people, you know, because of the lack of flexibility in certain companies, you see more women stepping away now from their jobs, reclaiming their future, going after passions and dreams. Um, I want to ask you, what advice do you have for those that are considering making a big career jump? And I, I feel free for anybody to jump in Marty. I know that you actually made this jump. Um, so Allison, I'll let you touch on it and then anyone feel free to jump in. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that um, I've tried to do with myself, but also it's a part of our organizational DNA is really just exploring, you know, the, the strengths that you bring to the table and the things that make you tick. So constantly going back to what actually gives you, you know, the energy and fuels you. And I think there are a lot of us that, you know, you go through different experiences and it forces you to do a little bit of reconciling with yourself on what actually do I want to be doing? And so I think the more we can have open conversations, help people explore those things, um, both pri you know, privately and professionally, um, you know, maybe it will help steer or give encouragement to people to go after a dream. So I don't know, what's your take, Marty? How did you go about making that leap of change? You know, I think that, and you guys can, can adhere to this and, and really lean into this, I was in corporate America and I was doing what the world told me I was supposed to be doing, right? And I found myself super unfulfilled by what success looked like on paper versus what my passions were, what my strengths were, um, and me really leaning into what God said my life was supposed to be. And so for me, there was really two reasons why I left the corporate America setting. One is I didn't see anyone who looked like me. And I think that it's so key for an instrumental for a woman who's navigating the landscape of corporate, um, for her to see someone along her pathway that looks like her, who has accomplished the things that she wants to accomplish. And so I didn't see that. So I didn't know if it was possible for me. Um, and then I had been in a place where I had imposter syndrome. I didn't know if I was good enough. I didn't know if I was smart enough. I didn't know if, you know, uh, my voice mattered. And so um, because I was dealing with all of those things and really, to be honest, just code switching from a cultural stance of this is how I had to act as a black woman in corporate America versus this is how I could act around my friends and family as a black woman, they didn't align. And so I decided to leave. Um, I left based off what my strengths were. I, I left based off what my gifts were. I left based off of what I ultimately wanted to do, but didn't also know that that was 
or could be my career path. So, you know, my career path has been a lot of navigating waters of the unknown and just really being ballsy and this and just kind of going after it. My path isn't going to be like someone else's. Your your own pathway is going to be uniquely yours. You just have to embrace that. Um, but for me, that's really why I took the big leap and started. Um, but I, I love people like Allison, Kellyanne, Rebecca, who are in corporate America spaces and are bringing others along so that they can see all of their big possibilities. And and I, I love my corporate queens because that's how we both make change happen by you guys being there, by be, me being in my space um, for, for us to make this world a better place. I feel like a song. <laughs> <laughs> Marty, can I just say, when I hear you talk about this, like just how incredibly brave you are, um, I'm sure that there's a lot of women who are hearing you um, talk about following your passions and your gifts. And it's, it's not easy. It is not easy at all. So kudos to you because that is such a tremendous leap of faith and that is betting on yourself right there. Um, that's really, really cool. And, you. you know, when I think about those types of transitions, I actually think about something I, I recently did. I'd never done this before. And it was based on a book I read um, by Marsha Clark, who's a local DFW um, woman and it's called Embracing Your Power. And in that book, the first couple of chapters are about writing your vision statement, declaring what it is that you want your life to look like, not next year, five years from now, but 30 years from now, 20 years from now. And so I did it. I wrote my personal vision statement and I was surprised honestly, by what kind of came out of me naturally. And so I really encourage everybody to do that because I think you're going to find your passions in that exercise. Mm -hmm. And what it took, what it, what I took away from that exercise was not that I necessarily need to change what I'm doing now, but it, it almost changed the way I was thinking about what I needed to get out of my experience now and what I needed to think about doing and who I needed to be surrounding myself with um, as I think about the future. So for those of you who are wanting to be brave, I really encourage you to take that step um, and then talk to Marty more because I, 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 I've never done it and I don't know if I could today. Um, and I'm so impressed. Rebecca, your, your, your smile says a million things. Like I, I want you to jump in. Cause I feel like you're, you're bursting at the seams again. Um, would you like to say something on this topic? You know, I was smiling when Marty talked about code switching, because I if you take a look at these little pearl earrings. Uh, it's one of the things that I, I always think about is like, who am I talking to? That's going to depend on what earrings uh, I wear, depending on the setting I'm going to. So I 100% understand, understand that, agree. Um, at the same time, I, I also think there are like our companies doing some, some really good things. We instituted flex time years before the pandemic, hybrid work when possible. Um, but look, I want to, I know we're going to get into this maybe later, but one of the questions is about why it is so important for people to and embrace for companies and to embrace DNI for women. Look, in 2021 in the fall, 61% of all students who signed up to get a bachelor's are female. At the same time, just last month, we saw that men came back to the workforce at 70% and women at 58%. So this is a simple economics issue. This is, are we going to embrace women to be leaders? everywhere? Or are we going to lose them to other places, have them drop out of the workforce because we can't have access to childcare? So if the answer is we've got to embrace, and it is, we've got to embrace and give women the opportunity to lead, then what can we all do? It's some people say, well, this person was not ready for a promotion. Well, how can you prepare them from a promo for a promotion? How can you make sure that she is getting the experience to lead a team or lead a project. And that's how we've, we've got to be thinking about it. It's not a favor. It's about, are we going to have sustainable companies, organizations, um, and are we going to have that labor force? You know what? That is such a great point. Allison and Kellyanne also, um, uh, mentioned what you're speaking of earlier. I love the transparency of the code switching. They mentioned if we're not having these conversations, 
everyone may not necessarily understand what people deal with on a daily basis before they even walk out of the front door to go into the office, right? It is a mental preparedness that we have to do before even leaving sometimes. And so just speaking on it, you know, allows everybody to, to be more aware. And I think that's what this conversation is about today. Um, and you brought up the diversity, equity, and inclusion. So let's talk about it. Y'all are making my job too easy today. Y'all are segueing everything. <laughs> that was great. Um, what does that mean to you all, right? Um, and I know that especially, you know, in corporate America, Allison, Kellyanne, Rebecca, and even for you, Marty, I know that you all are advocates for diverse talent. So um, how can we support DEI efforts in our workplace and in, in the communities? I mean, some of it, I think, starts with challenging just the the paradigm on what we see as the traits of successful leaders. And, you know, going back to maybe even why some of these topics around having to code switch and, you know, when there's not space at all to let people be authentically themselves and still get the job done just because it happens to maybe be done in a slightly different way is, is definitely a very deeply rooted issue that I don't have all the, you know, answers on how to overcome that. But I think some of it starts with, you know, helping to, you know, really, you know, equity is, is really more about giving people the right opportunities, um, you know, to, to have themselves be able to, to play. And so creating opportunities to, like was said earlier, you know, create projects or experiences or connections or, relationships that could, you know, help somebody get started on something, but still encouraging them and having a support network there that can allow them to still be themselves and not feel this immense pressure to replicate what everyone else looks like. And that I think is a really, really tough thing, much harder for some than others, just based on, you know, the, the circumstances. So I think that's definitely a a, a big topic. Um, and then the other one I would say is, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but the whole ecosystem, I think, has to be aware of the problem. And so if, if, if just the women in the organization, as an example, are trying to pave the way for an equitable workplace and an inclusive workplace, I think we'll only ever get so far. And, you know, how we can kind of bring the, the men of the organization along as well as really critically important since they're often decision makers on topics and talent and promotions and things like that. And one um, program that we leverage in our organization, which is a really phenomenal program, it's through um, the Catalyst organization, which is an organization focused on making uh, women in the workplace, um, improving the lives of women in the workplace, specifically also for women of color. They have a program called Men Advocating for Real Change, MARC, M-A-R-C. And um, it's a great program to get the men in your organization involved in where they, you know, really have some life changing experiences to be able to actually understand the perspectives maybe of the of the women in the organization. So I think finding ways to build that allyship is is critical to DE&I coming to life in a in a meaningful way. You know, I, I I'm so passionate about the topic of DE and I because I, 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 I feel like it's my obligation to create an equitable society as a woman in this world right now. And so, um, you know, at Boston Media, we are creating equitable programs, equitable opportunities for women to thrive, whether that's through funding, whether that's through um, programs that we're creating so that she can see herself whether that's through connectivity. I think it's all a part of it. Um, but we really challenge the partners that we bring on to not just showcase at a high level the one only that they have, woman, Black woman, woman of color that's in spaces and places, but we really share a pipeline with them on how they can be inclusive at a level that's entry, but then what is the pipeline look like to get them to a leadership, right? Are you recruiting at HBCU colleges? For those colleges, can we help you along that journey at Boston Media? 
Um, are you um, inclusive of a pathway for others, right? So often we assume the role and responsibility is on the employee, um, but as a leader, it is for you to bring them along on the journey, to expose them, to give them the tools. Um, and so things that I didn't have in corporate America, um, no one necessarily pulling me alongside them along my pathway journey is really what I share to our partners on how to do alongside us. Um, often, if you've not been the only one, you don't know what it's like. Um, you don't know the exclusiveness of what that is. And so us just talking about shared experience so that others can be empathetic to that first generation college graduate who um, is taking on a corporate career who doesn't know how to navigate that pathway. We need to supply them with the resources so that they can be a leader um, on their career path as well. And so I love creating an equitable society for all through DE&I and the, and the lanes and the approaches of doing it. And the, the approaches are infinite on, on how we can make it better. There's been so many great points made by all three of you. And I think that I, I think back to one of my first days on the job when I started leading the HR organization three years ago, and I asked for diversity data. I wanted to know what the percentage of women, people of color was at every level of the organization. I wanted to know what their compensation looked like. I wanted to know um, what promotion rates looked like, because at the end of the day, especially when you're in an organization like ours, which is a financial services group, uh, numbers matter. That's the love language of the people on my leadership team. And it started there, it started with awareness. And from that awareness, we were able to build allies. And just recognizing seeing that data um, helped them to start making some different decisions. And it wasn't that they were making bad decisions per se before, they just weren't making inclusive ones because they didn't know um, what opportunities they were losing out on. And so for those of you who are in a position to be pushing on that, data is a great place to start um, because you see only what's around you. And if you are um, a man and a white man at that and you're surrounded by white men, you're not thinking about what you're missing um, because you're not experiencing being that person of one as Marty just talked about. Uh, but the other thing that, and there's so much that we could talk about on this topic, so I won't, I won't go further than that, but I love the chat and the nail color comment because it does speak to how women do think differently. And I think especially women of color have to think differently about how, how they're wearing their hair, what clothes they're wearing. And, and all of that, I think, is um, something that we all need to be aware of and embrace. We should be embracing um, people bringing their, um, bringing their true selves to work, whatever that might look like. And for each of us as women, that starts with modeling the way ourselves. If you're in a leadership position, um, you should be modeling that yourself. Um, bring yourself to work. Be transparent um, and be inclusive in your own style. And I'll tell a brief story about that. It was a few years ago. And I, I don't know what got into me, but I wanted to dye my hair pink. Um, I've always wanted to dye my hair pink um, for all those 80s babies Kelly, out there. You are you such a gem. vibe. I promise oh. people would never know, but I swear. I love this. So, all right, Jem, Jem, she was truly, truly, truly outrageous. I loved Jem like deeply. I was Jem four years running for Halloween. I wanted to dye my hair pink. So I do it. And then the next morning I get a, a note from my boss that says, oh, I want you to present to these investors. And I freak out. I call my hair lady and I have her change it back overnight. I was like, oh my God, what have I done? I can't walk in there with pink hair. This is crazy. Pink hair is very extreme. Pink nails probably would have been okay. Pink hair, not okay. Um, so I changed it back. And you know, I was like, you know what? Excuse my language. Screw that. Like, I'm going to have pink hair. And so I dyed my hair hot pink and I walked into the office. It happened to be um, International um, Women's Day. And I wore a This Is What a Feminist Looks Like t-shirt with my pink hair. And not a single man didn't notice me that day. Um, and we had a conversation about feminism in the workplace. And so um, I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to dye their hair pink. <laughs> and I still question that decision sometimes. But um, I you know, one thing that it did for me that I've seen since is it emboldened other women to do something different too. And that's what I love seeing. So I was in a very fortunate position where I was able to be myself. And if you're in such a fortunate position, I really encourage you to do that too, because people will follow. Um, so lead the way, um, dye your hair pink or blue or purple, 
do whatever you want to do with your nails um, because that's how other women will follow suit. And so um, I love my what pink hair. What a great to story. Day. Oh my good Look, there's so many people in the chat that are like, yes, hot pink hair. Re yeah. Rebecca is getting ready to go buy dye her hair. Hot pink. No. <laughs> yeah. Tell him, yeah. It was, it was, a, it was a good look. It was a good look for me. It was a good look for me. Sometimes I think about going back. But. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, I cannot believe you guys, we are literally only 20 minutes away from ending. Um, we're, we're going to really try to get to your questions. Cause I know that the chat has been blowing up just a couple of more questions for our panel. Um, let's talk about the burnout and anxiety, right? Um, we talked earlier about trying to balance, uh, Marty, I'll direct this one towards you, but I'm pretty sure you all ha have, you know, experience this. You're trying to balance between running a media company, you're writing books, you have a new baby. Um, there is a lot of never ending anxiety and, and burnout. And you're thinking about the future and trying to figure life out every single day. Right. Um, how have you dealt with this? How do you deal with this challenge? Or are you still trying to figure it out every day? Both. I'm still trying to figure it out every single day, if I'm completely honest, you know, um, we, I started this media company four years ago and, you know, we're churning and burning, we're growing really well. Um, and then I get pregnant in a pandemic and, um, you know, life just really turned itself upside down. Not only did I get pregnant in a pandemic, but, um, after we, I delivered my baby, we spent the first 35 days in the NICU. And so, um, it was hard to balance um, what that looked like as an entrepreneur trying to navigate caring for a child who was still being and for me I had to number one I had to lean into God like I, I have to give credit where credit is due like I had to, my faith had to show up for me like that's what worked for me um, but then secondly and as a new mom trying to navigate these waters I was still pitching to companies I remember I pitched to um, a partner, Amazon, um, three days after I gave birth. Like, I'm not saying that, that I would even recommend that, but for my well being and all of the chaos that was going on around me, I had to lean myself into work. Then I brought a baby home, you know, and I didn't know what to do. I'm a new mom. I have no idea how to take care of this new child. And so, I had to establish a morning routine. That's how I had to eliminate my anxiety. That's how I was able to eliminate the burnout of waking up in the morning, reading a devotional, connecting and manifesting what my visions are. What are the values of my family? What are the values that I connect with? What's the vision for my life? And what are my goals for the week? I had to ground myself in those key areas in order to not drown, suffocate, heck, have anxiety, um, and, and just really ground myself in who I am, whose I am through that morning routine. And so that's something that um, has really helped me along the journey, establishing a morning routine on not connecting with others and connecting with yourself before you allow the world to suck the life out of you is key in Everything that you do, whether you're working in corporate or you are side hustling or an entrepreneur, um, grounding yourself in who you are. And then I have power moments. My power moments look like me listening to a podcast. My favorite podcast to listen to is How I Built This. That helps me get inspired to hear the stories of others who've gone along this treacherous journey and how they made it out then I get belief in myself. And so your power moments are how you're instilling and investing back into yourself of that morning routine. I don't miss it. Every single morning, it happens for me. And um, that's how I eliminate the burnout. Um, and of course, sleep, going to the spa, all that's cool, all that's fun, but I have to establish it daily because I can't go to the spa every day. So what is the thing that I can do every day? I can pour into me and I can show up for the life that I want to live. That's good. Would anybody else like to chime in, Rebecca? Yeah. Look, I think as women, often we fall into this trap where we don't know how to say no. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, I found myself on so many 
boards and leading so many initiatives and I was just drained and it was not only bad for me, but it was bad for those organizations because I, I was too busy to give each one the time that it deserved. So I made a new rule. I started to drop off everything and I decided to pick one big thing a year, right? So this meant one year doing the League of Women Voters, Susan B. Anthony luncheon, one year doing the Annie's List one. Um, no child care group, I can't do it this year, but I'll do it in two years. So really starting to plan it out. And you know, a few years ago for me telling them, oh, I'll do something in two years that would have seemed outrageous, but it's really helped me to manage things better, give those things more focus, um, just to do one big thing a year. And a small tip, something that's helped me emotionally recently is just reading more, spending some time on Saturday, Sunday mornings before bed, just reading. And you can see other people going through the, the same things, the same emotions you're feeling. That's really helped to ground me. Hmm. That's good. I love Rebecca. I mean, it's like such tangible tips, especially scheduling the time because in hearing Marty so eloquently put like what it means to pour, pour back into yourself. But when things get busy, put that on the calendar um, and, and make your make yourself really intentional. And the morning routine is something that I too have adopted um, over the pandemic because I really needed something to lift me out of um a funk. And so I started meditating using the Calm app. And so if you've never, if you've never done it, I encourage you to try the Calm app because yes. it makes it easy. Um, meditating seems really intimidating to somebody who's got like a thousand things going on in their head at, at any one given time, but that really helped me. And then the other thing I started doing is I started dancing by myself. I would put on some music. It would be like, 4:45 in the morning and I would just dance for 15 minutes and um and I still do it not every day but some days and I'll tell you it just puts me in a better mood and I show up differently um as a result of that so whatever if it's dancing if it's reading if it's meditating if it's praying do something for you um every single day that kind of helps you to fill your cup it doesn't have to be a lot it can be a little but it, it makes a big difference um but you know the other thing I would say about burnout is going back to something that Allison said earlier and that's like raise your hand if you need help. Um, I have not done that well historically. I think women generally are not wired to ask for help, um, but it's okay to ask for help. Um, whether that's in your workplace or in your personal life, find ways to get the support that you need. And um, again, it goes back to as women leaders, including the group on this panel, modeling that way. Um, I've found that when I've raised my hand and shared where I'm at personally, that it gives other people the license to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so if you're in that position, really model the way um, because it'll help somebody else in finding their answer to addressing the burnout that I know we've all faced. I was feeling really good that I had a one day a week routine of, but now listening to you guys, I realize okay, I've got to step up my game to get this daily routine going because I was feeling really proud that, you know, Sundays for me is just where I've started to actually carve out intentional time for myself. It's usually in the morning, isn't always in the morning just because of how things end up going, but just planning the week, reflecting on, you know, the things that I'm trying to keep as a priority and doing a little bit of a check and balance of whether or not I'm, I'm living up to that or not. Um, but I love all the, the tips. I think we just have to each find, you know, for ourselves kind of what works to give ourselves just a little bit of fuel. And, and the other thing for me is just, um, maybe giving ourselves the same forgiveness that we would give to other people, because I think, mm -hmm you know, if I think about the types of conversations I have with people on my team or coworkers, friends, whatever, you know, I think I'm a pretty generous person with helping people to kind of, you know, put it in perspective and, you know, you can't do it all. And you did such a great job on this. You should feel great about that. You know, don't put all the pressure on yourself. And then I think about myself and I don't have those same internal dialogues. It's, um, it's always the, you know, you should have done more, you could have done better, you know, you didn't get everything done. And so that for me is a daily, you know, ongoing, I guess, challenge is to, to, to treat myself the same way and give myself the same grace mm -hmm. or forgiveness on, um, on it all, because otherwise it is too much. I mean, there's just, there's so much happening everywhere we look, we're all, 
overstimulated with reality, but also media and, you know, all of the intensity that's happening to so many people in the world. And, you know, somehow trying to carve out and give yourself a little forgiveness, I think is, is also something. That is great. And Allison, you don't beat yourself up. Look, you're doing good Sundays. I wake up at Sunday. three o'clock in the morning for work every day. I'm like, I'm not waking up any earlier for a morning routine. <laughs> that's, so a to, 3 that's, that's no joke. Oh my gosh. But I'll, I'll figure it out one day. I, I will. Um, this is a little off script, um, but I do want to touch on something really fast. Uh, Rebecca, and, and, and I, again, I do want everybody to chime in on this one as well. I was reading an article and you told a story where um, I guess you had a job in your 20s, you loved it, and you ended up going to maybe coffee or lunch or something with a really close friend. And um, your friend challenged you. And your quote was, when you're no longer learning, it's time to move on. I That hit me like a ton of bricks, right? So can you tell us a little bit about that? And um, th- that is so profound. <laughs> I mean, you have no idea, just that simple statement, when you're no longer learning, it is time to move on. Yeah. So I was working in politics and when you work for somebody else, you have their, you're so nervous that you make one mistake and it's going to fall on whoever you're working for. So at this time I was working for an organization and I, I didn't have that pressure anymore. And I, I loved it. I was doing political communications. I started getting on national news, writing, getting published via op-eds. I was loving my job, having the best time. I'd been there a year and uh, my friend and mentor says, let's go to coffee. He said, what are you doing next? And I said, what do you mean? I love this job. I'm having so much fun. He said, is this where you want to be for the rest of your life? I said, no. Okay. Well, um, if you stay here any longer, are you going to learn any new skill? Are you going to increase your network? Are you going to learn something by staying that you haven't already learned in the time you're doing this? And he said, and if the answer is no, you've got to move on. And so I made a jump. I I went to, you know, a congressional race and then that experience, which which I had never done and it was very hard. And then that experience led to Congress because I had worked in a congressional right race, which led to, okay, now she's got state and federal experience, which led to a statewide race, which led to, you know, a fortune 50 doing government affairs, which led to something else. And I, I, I look back and I think about some of the people I started my political work with and the mistake that they made is that they didn't move. They didn't move on. And as I kept moving on to something else, even though it was uncomfortable, it was something that I wasn't sure I was going to dominate. I started gaining new skills, which made me more marketable for the next big thing. I still say that's the best career advice I've ever gotten. Wow. Wow. Anybody else want to chime in on that? And everybody is just like, yeah, oh gosh. (laughs) Yeah, that was really good. I was like, I think she should write a book. Um, (laughs) What an incredible journey. You know, I think it kind of goes back to our imposter syndrome comment, Um, you know, and, and what we were talking about there, it's scary to try new things, but in trying new things, you're learning something new. And every time, and you could hear that in Rebecca's career journey, every time she tried something new, it led to something even bigger. And so there's so much opportunity in stepping out of your comfort zone, even just one time, do it one time and it will lead to really good things for you. And even if that's not your forever career, it'll teach you something that's going to inform where you go next. And like I said earlier, by just jumping in and swimming outside your lane, you're going to find that every time you're asked to jump in the next time, it gets a little bit easier. That's good. And and I just want to say it doesn't have to, you don't have to change companies or change. It can be a new project, right? Can you lead a new initiative, um, start something new, a new community effort, just offer to lead that. And that makes you get more experience and gets you also noticed. Mm -hmm. That's good. I I want to read a question from uh, one of our viewers today. It says, what advice would you give women who don't have a college degree, but are strong contributors in their jobs and professional circles? Should they pivot and start a new career or how should they continue to grow professionally? 
That's a great, that's a great question. Um, and I don't mind jumping in to start because there's, there's several women on my team who um, have grown to great heights in their career, not having gone down the traditional path. And, and I think that that, what that's really about is again, just exploring what it is that you truly want out of your career. Where is it that you want to go and be open to all of the possibilities? Because there are some, um, there are some places where getting a college education might be an important part of that role. And if that's something that is, make sure you're at a company that'll help pay for it. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there that'll help to support that type of career path for you. But then the other thing I would say too, is that um, at least for me and in our organization experience, um, willingness to try something new and raising your hand for the hard projects um, and getting noticed in that way is the key to success. I care a whole lot less about a piece of paper and a lot more about your values and how you show up every day. Mm -hmm. And make sure that if that's something that is important to you, that you're in an organization that values that too. Um, I think you'd be surprised by different people and their their journeys to get to where they are. But um, I think today more than more than ever, with a recognition of what student debt does to families and what it does to people, there's an acceptance that it's not always that path that leads to the best and brightest contributors in your organization. So make sure that you're somewhere like that. And if college is something that you want to do, go, go for it. Um, but go to a place where they might help you in that journey as well. Beyonce said it best, oh. the school of life. That's you know, the school of life will teach you more than, you know, I have my master's, I have my MBA from top business school, but I learned more when I was actually working and navigating and in, in the, the weeds of whatever the project is, whatever the brand was every day, than I did learn in school. You write your experiences down, tell the story of what you have experience in. And oftentimes, as Killian said, that is how you can enter into new positions, into new roles, into new companies. Um, the school of life is the experience that people are often looking for. And if you can speak to that and tell the story from that, that's, that will lend you to more opportunities. Um, than necessarily sometimes just a sheet of paper. I was thinking also just around all of that combined and coupling it also with, you know, having those trusted advisors that you have in your circle. You know, if I reflect on Rebecca's comments around, you know, the person who, you know, said to her, hey, are you still developing? And, you know, and, and then she must have had some level of trust with that person to kind of start to reflect and consider and, so I think, you know, also having someone who can help be a bit that advocate, one, to encourage you, but also, you know, it isn't always so easy to necessarily have your experiences translate over perceived requirements um, that might be there, depending just on the culture of the organization or, or what your job is. So maybe also explore, you know, who you have in your circle that can, you know, can also help help open doors or, or be someone to, to help do the storytelling, you know, or help you get your own storytelling, you know, down, down pat. There's I one other thing I would, oh, well, go ahead, Kelly, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. One other thing I would add to that, and that's from a DEI perspective in which we were talking about this, um, college requirements are a limiting factor when you consider inclusion in the workplace. And so one of the things that we've actually started doing is stripping that out of the job description or as a requirement, because it's so much more about your ability to do the job. And there's a lot of opportunities, even at um, Mr. Cooper, where a college degree isn't required. A lot of uh, school of life, um, Beyonce always says it best, the school of life is really what matters most. And so um, from a D and I perspective, I also found that that's a really important consideration because um, you don't know what somebody's access to that opportunity has been. Not everybody has the great fortune of going to college. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not incredibly intelligent, capable, and willing to work really hard. And so that's something else that we've thought about. And if you're in that position as a leader, you should think about that too. Kellyanne, I need your, I need your playlist. Cause all I'm saying is like, you are really referencing some songs that I, I need to pull back up. <laughs> Marty, Marty started it. So <laughs> it's a good one now. Um, Kellyanne, I do want to say, um, thank you for your servant leadership. Uh, you were the most wonderful past chair of women build. Uh, you've always been a fierce advocate for women. Um, 
How does being a part of Women Build help women across Dallas? Oh. Um, I, I could go on for a really long time about this. And I just keep on going back to the fabric of our community. Um, women are the hearts of the home and our community. And by helping women through Women's Build, whether that's through the financial literacy programming that they have, the credit counseling that they offer, or building a home for a, a very well-deserved woman, you're really changing um, not just one person's life, but so many people's lives, um, including the community. And so for me, it's about about, again, that power of one, uh, really becoming the power of an entire community by be getting involved in the women's build. And the other thing I would say is just, you know, being privileged enough to stand beside Tracy, who was our homeowner last year, and raise the first walls of that home with her was incredible. But handing the keys to her um, was a moment I will never, ever forget. Um, I didn't make it without crying. I don't think anybody made it without crying because you see in that moment that um, you're changing a life and you're changing her children's lives and you're changing her brother's lives and her mom's life. And um, and that there's just like nothing more powerful than that. It's really- Kelly, and I want to say something to you. Um, I appreciate the role that you play. Um, I'm not from Texas, I'm from Tennessee, but my mother got her first home through Habitat for Humanity. Um, and have, having her be a part of that homeowner because of women like you who are advocating um, is such a, you don't understand the, the purpose and the, um, the place that you are in to give opportunity. So thank you for the place that you're in right now. Thank you for Habitat for Humanity. Um, because they truly are transforming the way um, generations are making impact um, of, of what's to come for their futures. Um, but because of that, and I, I love that you had that moment with that lady. Oh my God. Well, look, right there. This is it. Right there. Full circle. You are, you know, your product of seeing a woman be gifted that path of home ownership and look at what you're able to do. Again, it's the power of one. You change one person's life and you just don't even completely understand the ripple effect. Thank you for sharing that. That's incredible. Amen. So Allison, um, can you tell everybody here today how they can get involved in, excuse me, in Women Build 2022? Um, there are different ways to support, um, become a sponsor. I mean, if you aren't inspired by the last 45 seconds. I mean, that's, it's amazing. Um, you know, Kellyanne, thank you for all your leadership last year and in general, and for being so open to Marty. That's amazing. Um, but ways to support, I think it probably goes back to some of the things in the beginning and the opening um, in the chat. There's all sorts of um, prompts on ways to donate. So that's one simple way. Any little amount helps. Um, you could become a sponsor. You could start a team. Um, we did that last year and our organization spent a couple of days out there on, um, on the build and it's, it's life changing. Join build days yourself, um, attend, be a part of the community, um, but please take time to look in the chat. You'll see all of the, the texts and the links to be able to do that. And I hope today inspired some people to get involved in whatever way that you can. Absolutely. And I'm jumping out there on the build side with you guys this year. So I cannot wait. I'm excited about All that. right. Yeah. We're going to get you a pink hat, you know, you have. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes. Can I, will I get it ahead of time so I can bling it out? No, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> we can work on that. So also don't forget, you know, this is new this year. You can also text to give, you can text women bill to two, four, three, six, five. Um, I want to get final thoughts uh, just to kind of wrap this whole thing up. This has been absolutely amazing. Uh, so inspiring. Thank you all for your time today. I, I cannot thank you all enough. Uh, Rebecca, I'll start with you. Um, some final thoughts for our viewers. Hey, this was super supportive. Great way to support each other. Somebody asked about the one tip and that is to become really, really good at one skill. And once you become very good at that one skill, you gain credibility to do other things. Great. Kellyanne? I think that what I would say, the one thing I would say is um, that the best bet you'll ever make is on yourself. So take a chance on yourself and you'll be amazed at the opportunities that come from that. Thank you, Marty. And even just to piggyback on that, once you bet on yourself, you stay consistent. You can be the most talented person in the room, but if you're not consistent and show up for yourself every single day, who cares? Day, decide your when you decided to bet on yourself stay consistent and you will see 
um, opportunity and growth for yourself. Thank you. Allison? I think for me, it's just been um, uh, an amazing conversation and it always reminds me how important it is just to slow down and just connect with other people because you realize, you know, I mean, I took something from everybody today and, you know, if we all slowed down a little bit more and just took time to connect and listen and share, it puts your own stuff in perspective and then also, you know, gives you lots of good ideas and tips. So Rebecca in particular, you gave some seriously precise um, takeaways, which I loved. So, um, so yeah, maybe share and connect and just, you know, remind yourself that we're all kind of in this, in this together. So really great point. Um, again, I can't thank you all enough. I, it's funny when we come on here, you know, we, we have our speeches prepared and we have all these things we want to say, but we're taking in the information as well. And we walk away with so many nuggets. Look, this is kind of like, Y'all, this is, excuse my uh, lipstick. This was supposed to be my lipstick blotter, but I have been taking notes this entire time. Like, oh my gosh, this is so good. This is so good. So um, you all have been an inspiration. Continue to, to inspire, continue to build women, continue to build communities. Um, and, and just thank you all. I'm going to bring Carmen back up uh, to close this out today. Every year, I think that Women Build cannot get better than the year before. And every year it's like, whoa. You guys were amazing. And I, and I hope to stay connected with all of you um, as well. I don't want to be the, this be the last time I, I speak to each of you. So thank you for your time. So I'll stop talking, Carmen. I'll send it to you. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I too have notes written all over my calendar that I just happened to have open. I've got schedule your time, give to yourself, start with one, pay it forward, lift as you rise. Um, you have what it takes for today. Um, Y'all, I mean, so many good things to take away from today. You're all really inspiring. I love the way that you have been supportive of one another, even in this discussion, right? I mean, just really loving on one another and loving on our audience today. I think the chat just really tells us how inspired everyone is. Um, there are so many ways to get involved in Women Build. Women Build was the uh, foundation, the pillar for this discussion. Um, we bring this up each and every year. Dallas Habitat, y'all, is trying to make a difference in the lives of women who seek a safe, decent home for their families. That is a basic need. And women all across Dallas are doing this on their own. They are single wage earners. Our teams are teaching them financial literacy, financial best practices. They're teaching them how to leverage their income to help move themselves forward financially. They're building generational wealth. So they're building asset wealth. At the end of 10 years, a family who purchases a Habitat home will have nearly $70,000 in equity. We're providing access to credit through a 0% interest mortgage for an affordable home for a family earning less than 80% of the area median income. This is how to make a difference. If you wanna know how to get involved and make an impact in the life of a woman, plug into Women Build. This is the way to do it. We've sent the links, we've sent email addresses. Uh, you have our website. These women have inspired us. Now let's put this into action. Let's put this learning and this inspiration into action. Go to our website, get involved in Women Build. We cannot wait to see you on the Build site. And stay tuned for our next events. They're all gonna be this great. Well, I don't know. This is pretty great. <laughs> I don't know. So thank you for being here today. We're so excited and so grateful for uh, each of you ladies that were here on the panel, for our audience um, and for the work that we're gonna accomplish together. Let's get to it. Have a good one, everybody. 